In the mid-16th century, a long-running conflict between two of the most powerful world religions is building up to a climactic battle in the Mediterranean for the very soul of Europe. The rise of the Ottoman Empire is quite an extraordinary piece of history. The speed, the extent, the directions in which it went, this was just something incomprehensible. It was almost a sort of end of the world, apocalyptic feeling amongst Christian Europe. Facing each other are two highly trained forces, the Knights of the Order of St. John, a small but formidable Christian military order, and the Muslim Janissaries, the fearsome crack troops of the Sultan. The Janissaries did have a very exalted notion of being God's soldiers, fighting for the Sultan and for Allah. The Knights of St. John were great seafarers, brilliant warriors, and dedicated to a perpetual war against the infidel. The historic events are told through the eyes of a young Ottoman conscript and his future arch-rival, a novice Christian knight. From an early age, both are trained to fight in the name of God and Allah. In the 16th century, two-thirds of the Mediterranean, the lands around the Black Sea, the Balkans and the Middle East, were part of a growing Ottoman Empire. This Muslim superpower was encroaching on the heart of Christian Europe. An Ottoman official is traveling with his guards through the conquered lands. The Ottomans ruled over a diverse mix of people, nomads, Christians, and Muslims, all existing side by side. The Ottoman state was always drawing in people from outside, other Muslims, Shia Muslims, Greeks, Jews, Bulgarians, learning from other people, expanding their army, expanding their administration, their ministers, their clerics, their shipbuilders, all the people with skills that they wanted. They attracted them in, and they did not insist on conversion. 14-year-old Alexius is late for church school. Begin. For the conquered Balkan Christians, their Greek Orthodox faith is the last bastion of the old Byzantine way of life. During church lessons, Alexius stares at the severed head of John the Baptist. The boy instinctively knows that his life will somehow be entangled with the followers of St. John. In the summer of 1555, 15-year-old French aristocrat Raymond travels with his servant Joseph to Malta on one of the ships of the legendary military order of St. John. 
By the time you get to the middle of the 16th century, the idea of Christian crusade is, to be quite honest, a bit passé. It's a, it's a harking back to um, an earlier heroic chivalric period. So the Knights of St. John in Malta were already an anachronism. But Raymond is fascinated by the stories of the glory days of the Crusades. I nobili sono veramente devandati, ricchi e famosi, combattanti in l'infidel. Ecco, io ho finito con i combattimenti. Questo è per te. Joseph captured the Muslim dagger when he served as a young mercenary for the Knights of St. John on the island of Rhodes. In 1291, the Order of St. John was driven out of the Holy Land. The Knights settled in Rhodes until 1522, when they were evicted by the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent for preying on his merchant shipping. Nine years later, the King of Spain offered the Knights a new naval base. The motives why Charles V gave Malta to the Knights um, are double-folded. The main motive for Europe was to have a shield, a shield against Ottoman aggression. Second was to divide the Mediterranean in two parts. Behind the facade, it was a good tool to keep the French at bay. The village priest has lined up a group of boys for inspection. Ottomans were good at keeping registers and records of variety of issues regarding taxation or register regarding the army. Once a year, Ottoman officials would visit the Christian Balkan villages to raise annual taxes under the Dershima system. The Dershima system has its historical roots uh, within the Islamic practices. Uh, when we look at the uh, former Islamic states, we see that the rulers did take captives during the wars, and one-fifth were used in the Muslim rulers' uh, army and the administrative strata. Certain rules of the uh, conscription system is to take children aged between 13 to 15 years old. One boy in every 40th uh, household was selected, so the officers cannot roam into a village and take uh, all the boys all at once. They should be able-bodied, uh, good-looking, clever boys, uh, uncircumcised. Most villagers dread giving up their children. Alexius's father has seen enough. He knows his son will be leaving. Alexius can't believe his father is letting him go, but the former Byzantine soldier has recommended his son for service. He hands his son a family heirloom a small icon of St. John. The defeated Byzantines with their capital Constantinople were the last remnants of the Roman Empire. With the fall of Constantinople, the Ottoman sultans recreated the Byzantine Empire. 
and by extension, they became a Turkish Muslim Roman Empire in the East. After being forcibly conscripted, the Christian boys are taken to Constantinople in groups of 100 or more. Alexius feels alone and abandoned, not knowing what his future holds. Once uh, the children were conscripted, they were dressed in red clothing and red hats. This was to prevent those children to run away because uh, the system was not based on voluntariness. Raymond is missing his family in France. One day, he'll return home a rich and famous knight. In the 16th century, many families tried to enroll their second or third born sons into the order uh, to, yeah, to provide them with a career, with income. Uh, we talk about 10, 12, 14 year old boys, and they would be then sent to Malta. And it even could be younger. Uh, they could be one or two or three years of age. Uh, and then 30 or 40, he would be a commander, uh, um, administering and ruling a commandery like uh, here in Meilberg, for example. The Order of St. John relied on its commandery estates to fund its fight against Muslim expansion. Built in the 12th century, Schloss Meilberg is one of the Order's oldest properties in Europe. A commandery has an income from harvest, from fields, from pilgrims, and this uh, commandery gives a percentage to the convent. This then flowed to Malta to take care of the fleet, of the military issues of the convent, of architecture, of the bastions, yeah, to keep the system running. The Order of St. John is organized in eight different language groups, or langs, with French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and Anglo-German knights. The Meilberg Commandery owns farms, vineyards, and still runs local churches and schools. Temple Cressing in Essex was one of the knight's wealthiest commanderies in Northern Europe. This barn is one of the most remarkable places in this part of England. It's a vast structure, and you have to imagine that in the medieval period, it's going to be full of agricultural produce, which is a source of wealth. So this kind of thing underpinned the entire system. In the Mediterranean, the Knights of Malta were the fiercest opponents of Ottoman expansion. The Catholic Habsburg Empire, led by the King of Spain, was preoccupied with the city-states of Italy, its old enemy France, and the Protestant kingdoms of the north. In the 15th and 16th century, Topkapi Palace was the residence of the Ottoman sultans. At the Sultan's Palace School, Alexius has just been circumcised, which is customary for all recruits arriving in Constantinople. The boy's face is measured. The Ottoman examiner notes his physique. In the pre-modern Muslim societies, uh, people belie believed in pseudosciences. The science of physiognomy means that you can tell a person's character by looking at his or her physical traits. If the boy is tall, he's believed to be goofy. Or uh, if he's cross-eyed, it's not thought that it will be a loyal person to serve in the Sultan's army. 
Alexius is put through a rigorous selection process, overseen by a palace eunuch. The very best of them went into higher administration. The very best of the best actually went into government and rose to positions of authority as effectively ministers. So this is not just recruiting for the army, it's recruiting for state service. The eunuch has chosen an Islamic name for the boy, but Alexius refuses to recognize his new identity. He's far too rebellious for the eunuch's taste. Hassan bin Abdullah. The eunuchs were mostly brought from Africa. Uh, they were uh, taken as captives, as slaves, castrated in Africa, and they had a very powerful role in the empire. They were the second strongest men after the Grand Vizier in the ruling. They controlled the budget and also they were in control of palace education. Hassan bin Abdullah. Great emphasis was put on loyalty, manners, and self-control in palace recruits. The stubborn Alexius is rejected for the Sultan's services. Instead, Alexius is sent to one of the toughest Janissary infantry schools. He's punished for his surly attitude supervised by the Bektashi Dervish military chaplain. Each Janissary regiment had its own chaplain. The founder of the faith hailed from Anatolia. Bektashism is a major Sufi order in the Ottoman lands. It's originated in the 13th century and uh, spread in Anatolia after the immigration of Turks and Mongols from Central Asia to Anatolia. Upset and lonely, Hassan cannot forgive his father. The Bektashi dervishes played an important role in the, after the conquest of the Balkan lands. This was mainly because of the tolerant attitude of Bektashis towards Christian beliefs. People felt that Bektashis were more approachable, and we know that Bektashi dervishes played an important role in the Turkification and Islamization of the region. The dervish chaplain believes Hassan has potential to be a good soldier. When the time comes, he will return the amulet. Raymond continues his journey to Malta. When a Muslim merchant ship is spotted, the Order's knights join in a prayer with the ship's friar. Venite, figli. Venite, preghiamo insieme. Padre nostro che sei nei cieli, sia santificato il tuo nome. Venga il tuo regno. Sia fatta la tua volontà. Come cielo, così in terra. In nome del Padre, del Figlio, del Spirito Santo. Amen. Amen. The job for the ship's chaplain was to take care of the soul of the faithful on board ship. So he would help them pray, he would encourage them before a battle, he would also listen to their sins. He would make sure that they do not turn to Islam or to Protestantism. The Order's ship moves in on the merchant vessel.
Raymond desperately wants to join the action, but is frozen by fear. All the military orders were notoriously ruthless. They tended to slaughter all their Muslim prisoners if they were above a certain age. Boys who would eventually become Janissaries were hired out to Turkish families. They had to conduct heavy duty labor. The intention was to have a strong body that is necessary for the, uh, for the military training. For the next four years, Alexius must do backbreaking work in the fields of Anatolia. He still refuses to respond to his Muslim name. If you want to sort of look at what happened to the bog standard, the ordinary bloke uh, who didn't get selected for anything special, he would quite soon be sent to a Turkish family to be um, taught Turkish, uh, taught the way of life, the way to behave. That was when conversion was normally done and we still don't know quite how much pressure, if any, to convert. The farmer's daughter takes care of Alexius. <laughs> Touched by the girl's kindness, he begins to feel more at home. Raymond arrives in Malta without his servant. Malta, before the Knights of St. John arrived, was a rock in the middle of the Mediterranean, a population of not more than 20,000 people. But it had one important thing, two large harbors. Those harbors were going to be perfect to protect the navy of St. John, which was the key to making money. Once the Knights settled in Malta in 1530, the knights were being a nuisance to trade. Corsairing and trade coexisted. Merchants were corsairs and corsairs were merchants. Raymond is excited by the bustling harbor, but without Joseph's protection, he's going to find his new life hard. The knight's novice is stopped by Juan, a Maltese nobleman who despises the arrogant knights occupying Malta. Juan works for Maria, a rich Maltese widow and ship owner who profits from raids on merchant ships. Raymond is captivated by her beauty and wealth. 
The notarial archives are a mine of information about the daily life and commerce of the time. You had Malta uh, that was basically um, the center of activity of corsairs during the Knights period and um, only Livorno in Italy rivaled Malta as a center um, of this corsairing activity. And then on the North African side you have Algiers. At Fort St. Angelo, you can hear the various languages spoken by the different nationalities of the order. Andiamo, andiamo. Novice Raymond is paired up with a less than enthusiastic warrior monk from the German Lang of the order. Each Lang had uh, a part of the administration of the order. So you had a Lang that took care of the sick, you had a Lang that took care of the navy, you had a lung that took care of the fortifications. Even the fortifications were split. So you had the, the post of Castile, you had the post of Provence, the post of England. It was all split. Everybody had to do a job. Vas-y, essaye encore. A knight of the Provencal Lang takes Raymond under his wing. Comme ça. The Lang offers protection to its fledgling knight. For the next six years, Raymond is taught by monks. He prays every day and trains with swords, halberds and muskets to prepare for his first caravan. Caravans are those armed, yeah, the armed expeditions of the Navy. You start your caravans with 18. You did four or five caravans. You go to Cyprus, or you go to the sea in front of Palestine, or you go to the North African coast, and then return, hopefully with prices, with 22, 23, you could be a professed knight. After years of hard labor, Hassan receives a visitor from the past. The Bektashi dervish returns his father's amulet of St. John. Janissaries were very prestigious soldiers. They were the elite soldiers that served only for the Sultan. They should at least train for 10 years. They received regular payments from the state. They resided in the barracks within the capital, very close to the uh, palace region. Uh, and their main duty was to protect the Sultan. Back in Constantinople, Hassan feels part of a Janissary band of brothers. They were trained as infantry. Archery, musketry, sword fighting. And taken very seriously indeed. We know it must have been effective because during this period, Christian European observers were astonished not only at the discipline of these people and their cleanliness, but also their skill with weapons. They were tended to be very good shots. Hassan throws himself into military training. He becomes inseparable from his fellow recruits. Hassan! Once the cadets become soldiers and enrolled into the uh, Janissary regiments, this brought a new and stronger set of loyalties for these soldiers. Being trained uh, by the same tutor and belonging to the same uh, regiment was the strongest loyalty that they developed. Hassan and his comrades swear an oath to fight to the death for each other. The dervish chaplain recites a Janissary war poem. Allah, Allah, 
Kill it, Shal Khan. Then he made the Vrenina. Who? Janissaries prayed all together. It includes uh, lots of chivalry explaining how the uh, uh, soldiers were very brave and killing the infidels. So this was like a spiritual preparation for the Janissaries. Yelim. After years as a novice, Raymond attends the most important ceremony of his life in the presence of the Order's military leader, Grand Master de Valette. Signore, le domande di essere iscritto all'ordine di San Giovanni. This oath, being a professed knight, uh, to do away with the worldly riches, yeah, to obey fully uh, to the Grand Master, I mean, to the convent, to the order. You are fully embraced in the family of uh, the Knights of St. John. Questo che voi domandate è così molto importante. Solita concedersi a quelle persone che per antico lineaggio proprio loro virtù sono stati giudicati degni In nome di Dio Nostra Signora di Fermo San Giovanni Battista e ti elevo al rango di cavaliere alzi il cavaliere From now on, Raymond will serve as God's loyal soldier. One night, Hassan breaks the rules by sneaking out of the barracks. His comrades will cover for him. He meets Emine, a Christian girl working in the coffee houses of Constantinople. The Janissaries had to remain celibate, uh, just like the Christian monks, uh, and isolated in the barracks. They could not integrate into the city life. The widow Maria is attending evening mass with the nuns. It is a women-only service. The Knight of the Order of St. John took a vow of celibacy. However, we know that um, they breached this vow often. They liked the pleasure of having a woman. With the booty seized from his caravan raids, Raymond can lavish gifts on his boyhood love. But Juan, her right-hand man, is jealous.
Raymond will not be pushed around by Juan anymore. Both are equally matched. A special militia patrols the debauched streets at night, imposing law and order. When you check young men yeah, in the blossom of the age, uh, being proud and uh, having arms and a big status, you can expect clashes and problems between different nations of different cultural backgrounds. Feeling superior to the locals and uh, drinking, having the money available, uh, doing, making debts. We have stories of knights dueling punching each other, killing each other. You have knights actually having illicit relations with Maltese ladies or also with ladies coming from Sicily or from Italy. Raymond realizes that he has risked his future as a knight for Maria. Just weeks after becoming Janissaries, Hassan and his comrades serve on an Ottoman raiding mission. Their fleet reaches the Maltese island of Gozo. Before the arrival of the Knight of St. John, life in Malta was very much like based on an agrarian type of economy. The inhabitants lived inland because they were very much afraid of corsairs. In fact, even in notarian documents where we have the renting out of parcels of land, there is stipulated that just in case there is a raid by these corsairs, the farmer is not obliged to give the produce that was um, stipulated in the contract. The villagers are unaware of the approaching raiders. The janissaries search the houses, kill anyone resisting, and drag the local population away into slavery. The Maltese were both victims and perpetrators of the slave trade, like all people in the Mediterranean. Um, they knew that um, at one point in their, in their life, they would almost fall prey um, to, to being slaves. Hassan recalls his own conscription when he was a boy, taken from his family. Investing in the corsairing activity, it was regulated because obviously you had people from all over the island who tried to become rich overnight, like widows, like peasants, who even invested whatever they had in this business. In front of the notary, you declared um, the type of investment you were going uh, to put in this expedition. Um, obviously, the heftiest part was um, in the ship itself and in arming the ship. There were other shareholders, the Admiralty, and then you also had the nuns of the knights who prayed for the Corsairs, who had another share. But the Grand Master was always on top of this list. Raymond has won Maria's heart and trust. 
she rewards him with his first command of a Corsair ship. Captain Raymond sets off for North Africa. We must admit that this was a religious war on both sides, on the Christian side and on the Ottoman side. You know that at the end of the day, you're going to get some good money, you're going to get some good profits, and you could build a lovely palace in France or in Malta and enjoy your gardens when you retire. On his way to Africa, Raymond spots an enemy ship. The Knights of St. John had an amazing reputation. These guys were born and bred to be navigators, soldiers, and defenders of Christianity. They were the other side of what the Janissaries were to the Ottoman Empire. On their return from the raid on Gozo, Hassan and his brothers in arms prepare for their first battle against the Knights of St. John. In this element. The, the Janissaries did have a code of honor and see each other as comrades. There was a very chivalric, exalted notion of being a god soldiers and fighting for Allah. Raymond's ship closes in on its target. More Muslim ships appear on the horizon. In the heat of battle, Raymond proves that he is now a ruthless holy warrior. Hassan is left for dead. He can do nothing to stop Raymond killing his friend. The rest of the Ottoman fleet arrives. The Janissaries prevail. <laughs> Raymond's dreams of being a great knight are over. <laughs> 
Hassan is determined to avenge his dead friend. The general tendency of the soldiers was to take as much captives as they can because they do have a, a share from these booties. The Janissaries were loyal to uh, Allah, Sultan, and the comrades. After a disastrous sea battle, Raymond has had his head shaven to mark him out as a galley slave. He must row hour after hour on a diet of dry bread and beans or face severe punishment. The Knights of St. John knew that there was a risk that you could become a slave. You prayed to the gods that you were going to be released. Some of the greatest grandmasters, some of the greatest Knights of St. John, actually became slaves of the Ottoman Empire. After years of training and fighting, Hassan has become a Janissary officer. His fatherly mentor, the Janissary dervish chaplain, initiates his protege into the Muslim Bektashi faith. After years of ransom negotiations with the Ottomans, Maria, a wealthy widow, has finally freed Raymond from his life as a galley slave. Usually, the order of St. John was actually paying for their release. And if you did manage to escape and come back to Christendom, the most important thing was to get your own back and sail out again and steal more slaves. Maria welcomes a merchant from Algiers. <laughs> Raymond resents Maria doing business with the Muslim trader, who's traveling on a special permit. We have the issue of these safe conducts from both sides of the great religions. From the Muslim side, documents permitted um, a seafarer who was a Christian uh, or who was a Jew to travel in enemy territory. There needed to be an exchange of redeemed slaves. The merchant offers a generous ransom for an Ottoman governor captured by one of Maria's ships. This would be given as a safe passage to a Christian traveler. It's very important to notice that this is the cipher of the reigning Ottoman Sultan. And you have this S sign, which means that the wind always blows from the east to the west for the Ottoman Navy because it is always going against the infidel. Maria suggests a joint business venture. She reveals her plans for a tavern in the harbour of Birgu. An interesting contract which I came across is the ransoming of a Muslim captives and in this agreement he is agreeing with his master that he will pay this amount of money to free himself. 
the slave is agreeing that he will run a tavern for his master and that the profits will be shared. The whole wasting of a holy war from both sides. But um, trade needed to flourish. The Grand Master's Palace is one of the grandest buildings commissioned by the Order in Malta. In front of the Grand Master's Palace, you have the Piazza San Giorgio, where was the old slave market of the order. Every household in Malta had slaves. Slaves were running businesses. Slaves were building fortresses. Slaves were used on the galleys as oarsmen. Slaves could be sold abroad. So slavery was one of the motors of Maltese economy. In 1565, one of the largest fleets the Mediterranean has ever seen is assembling in Constantinople. The order's naval raids were a thorn in the side of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. When news reaches his palace that the knights have captured two of his governors and a 101-year-old family nurse, Suleiman is forced to act. Suleiman was fuming at how the order was treating his subjects. He had let the order surrender with full military honors in Rhodes, and they had sworn not to attack his ships again. Obviously, they broke that immediately. By 1565, he had had enough. He wanted to show no mercy. Not far from the Sultan's palace, over 200 ships are loaded with soldiers, horses, and artillery, ready to annihilate the Knights of Malta. You have to remember that the idea of the crusade had not gone from the minds and the fears of the Muslim peoples and rulers of the Middle East. It was a relatively recent memory. Above all, it was the fear of this potential military base for a future crusade. That was what really frightened the Ottoman Sultan. The Ottomans set off on a 50-day journey. En route, they pick up gunpowder, cannonballs, food and soldiers from all over the empire. It's a massive operation that only the Ottomans are capable of. Suleiman the Magnificent needed to pull a lot of strings to make this happen. He had a huge, vast empire and to get 30,000 men together, you needed to get troops from one side of the empire to the other. Those troops needed to be fed. You also needed gunpowder. You needed the bronze for the cannons. It was a logistical nightmare, but Malta had to be taken. On the way to Malta, the expedition's commander, Mustafa Pasha, reminds his officers of the Sultan's ruthless orders. The time has come. Raymond must face his enemies once again. The Order of St. John knew that an attack was coming. They had spies in Constantinople. All the knights around Europe got a letter from the Grand Master, come to the aid of the convent. We need every man we can get in Malta. 
mercenaries, adventurers from all over Europe who were flocking into Malta, getting ready for the fight. And the Tercios, the best troops that the Spaniards had, would augment the military force that the Order and the Maltese had. During the siege preparations, Grandmaster de Valette solicits help from the Order's extensive network. From Scandinavia to the Mediterranean, the Order of St. John's Commanderies hurriedly send money, soldiers and arms. The knights gather in Sicily, responding to their Grandmaster's call. After the arrival of the Muslim fleet, Raymond's militiamen are called up. The Knights of St. John found a system in Malta that every man who could bear arms, so 16 upwards, had to do military service. Now, suddenly, this militia became a standing army to protect the island, and they were getting training every week on a Sunday. After you go to mass, you go to training to use the arquebus, the sword, and the shield. Raymond orders his militia to burn fields and villages. The Grand Master gave the orders that the wheat would be cut beforehand in May and brought into, into Birgu. The old and the infirm and the women had to be taken to Sicily for safety. Whilst other women and children flee Malta, Maria is determined to stay, to be close to Raymond. Commander Mustafa Pasha is incensed by the scorched earth tactics of the knights. The arrival of the Ottoman fleet is memorialized on the walls of the Grand Master's palace. The murals were created by Matteo Perez de Leccio, who spoke to many veterans before he painted his historically accurate account of the Great Siege of Malta. The Ottoman forces land at Marseschlok and set up camp around the forts of the Grand Harbor. Hassan surveys the barren landscape. They must push for quick victory. His men are dependent on the island's limited resources for food and water. Normally, with traditional sieges, it's the defenders who are going to get starved out, and the people who are surrounding them control the countryside and therefore have access to food. The siege of Malta was a bit different because the Ottoman army were also dependent on food being brought to them by ship. Both armies could, in a way, outstarve each other and win. Do you control the sea? Hassan discovers that the wells have been poisoned with animal carcasses. A big setback for his troops. Start your bit. On the eve of battle, Grand Master de Valette gives a stirring address to his knights. Combattiamo per la Santa Cristianità, per il nostro padrone, San Giovanni. Siete tutti i soldati di Dio.
After de Vallette's speech, an impassioned Raymond volunteers to defend the vital fort of St. Elmo. Built by the Knights, Fort St. Elmo guards the entry to the Grand Harbor. Whoever holds the fort holds the key to the island. The volunteers that actually went to St. Elmo were Knights and the Maltese militia. These were the bravest, the staunchest Knights and soldiers that there were on the island. Anybody who went to St. Elmo knew that he would either die in the name of the faith or survive and become a hero. Raymond is touched by Maria's selfless decision to stand by him during the siege. He hands her poison in the event of capture and enslavement. The Order's Grand Harbour is held by 500 knights, 1,800 Spanish and Italian soldiers, and 3,000 Maltese militia. But they're up against 30,000 Ottomans, including 6,000 elite Janissary soldiers. Fort St. Elmo is manned by only 50 knights, backed up by 500 Spanish and Maltese troops. The Grand Harbor was protected by the Knights with various things. Fortifications, very good artillery, and there was a huge chain made out of metal that would actually block the entrance of the harbor. Hassan targets a Christian position to cover his engineers who are building trenches and gun batteries. After days of bitter fighting, Raymond and his militia are on guard duty. Being in a fort, surrounded by sharpshooters was psychological warfare. You are constantly in fear of being shot at. If you are a defender, you have to put your head above the wall because you need to see where the enemy is coming from. You need to see if the enemy is putting countermines or uh, charges that would explode and destroy your fort. Raymond is frustrated by his untried soldiers. The Janissaries did have the latest weapons in the world. We know that they were one of the earliest armies that used musketeers during the conquests. Raymond is determined to take revenge. Under the cover of morning fog, Raymond leads his men on a sortie against Hassan's snipers. <laughs> But then, Hassan's Janissaries reinforce their position. <laughs> Raymond and Hassan confront each other again.
the Christians retreat. Faith played a very important part in motivating the Maltese. The Maltese had a long tradition of being the lords of the frontier against the Muslims in North Africa. Also the fact that their loved ones might fall prey and be victims, they might become slaves to the Ottomans, that was a great fear. With their cannons in position, the Ottomans bombard St. Elmo day and night. The fort's walls are beginning to crumble. In St. Elmo, the defenders knew that they were in for a tough fight. They were being bombarded, they were being shot at. If you see the cannonballs that the Ottomans were firing, these were huge marble stone balls that were battering against the bastions. But the Knights of St. John and the Maltese knew that if they held their position, they could buy time. The small but strategically important St. Elmo, opposite the Knights' headquarters of Fort St. Angelo, protects the harbours of Birgu and Sanglia. Hassan spots suspicious activity at the base of the fort. The Ottoman batteries prevent the Christians from resupplying the fort by boat. But Maltese swimmers keep lines of supply and communication open with the Grand Master. Hassan orders an attack. Maria receives dreadful news. St. Elmo has been cut off from all supplies. She fears for Raymond. Desperate, Maria considers taking the poison. She doesn't want to live without the man she loves. Instead, she sacrifices their beloved dog to help save dwindling food and drink supplies, as ordered by the Grand Master. Grandmaster de Valette is writing to his ambassadors to lobby the rulers of Europe for urgent support. Being a kind of international institution, the order needs persons uh, always being in contact with the rulers. Every important court in Europe, uh, there was installed charge d'affaires, yeah, a person who's uh, running the business and the lobbyism for the order. Since the Order of St. John arrived in Malta, Fort St. Angelo has been their headquarters. The Knights of Malta today are a sovereign state without land. They even issue their own passports. When the Order started to emerge in the 12th, 13th century, it was a, a brotherhood of friars. The main saint of the institution is St. John the Baptist, and this reminds us of the old vocation of the order to support pilgrims, uh, to be there for the sick and the poor, to run hospitals. Up to 
After three weeks of relentless bombardment, St. Elmo's outlying fortifications are overrun. Wave after wave of attacks have left most defenders injured or dead. As the battle persists, Grand Master de Valette uses Fort St. Elmo to frustrate the invasion force. The Janissaries mourn their comrades. One of Hassan's officers has had enough. <laughs> Hassan is enraged that his men are not focused on their duty. From the embattled fort, Raymond writes a farewell letter to his beloved Maria, to be sent with one of the last messengers to get out. Mio carissimo Angelo Maria, sono pronto a morire. Spero che rimarrò sempre nel tuo cuore come l'indomabile soldato di Dio. Por favor, envía esto a nuestro gran maestro. The knights seek permission to retreat so they can live to fight another day. The last phase of the siege, Fort St. Elmo could not be relieved by other forces and no one could escape. In so far, who was there were there to the end. De Valette responds by appealing to his men's honor. Votre pétition pour quitter son terme a été accordée. Ce soir, vous pouvez ramener les bateaux. Rentrez, mes frères, au couvent, chez vous à Birgo, où vous serez plus en sécurité. Je serai plus rassuré quand je saurai que la forteresse est gardée par des hommes en qui j'ai pleine confiance. None of the knights accepts their Grand Master's offer to retreat. The non-stop bombardment has smashed a large breach in the wall. On the 23rd of June, 1565, a fanatical Ottoman regiment, fueled by hashish, attacks. The first Ottoman wave has been beaten back with heavy losses. A lot of knights died defending the fort, but on the other side, the Ottomans lost a lot and a lot of troops. The final onslaught on the fort was a bloody affair. 
All the knights and the Maltese knew that the end was near. Emboldened by their faith, the defenders are willing to die for their god. Adveniat regnum fiat voluntas tua. Sicut in cielo es in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie et dimit debitas nostra. Sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostri. Et ne nos inducas in tentazione. Sit libera nos amalo. Amen. 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 Since arriving in Malta as a novice, Raymond has become a true leader of men. The knights were tired, the Maltese were tired, there was no water, they were hungry. Some of them were so injured that they actually tied themselves to a chair so that they could fight, literally sitting down. The time has come for Hassan to send in his janissaries. soldiers break through the Christian lines. In the last phase of the siege, it was only fighting men against men because there was no space anymore to use muskets and artillery. The last hours was quite an epic fighting. I mean, you have uh, fighting with your daggers and your knives and your swords. Man against man, there was no way to escape. The last hours really was uh, like a butcher, a butcher scene. Hassan comes face to face with Raymond for one final showdown. Siege warfare was always the worst because of the suffering involved, the potential for massive casualties, people get slaughtered. The survivors await their judgment from Commander Mustafa Pasha. Hassan senses their certain death. Yes, you don't know.
Tanrı'nın askerlerisiniz. Bu sefer merhamat yok. The Janissaries are ordered to dispose of the captives. Hassan is appalled by the senseless waste of life. From the eyes of a 21st century historian, the atrocities that occurred during the siege were horrible. We know that knights were mutilated, knights were thrown into the sea so they could be drifting towards Birgu and Sanglia. The Pasha's strategic aim was to break the morale of the Christians in the remaining forts. On the other side of the bay, Maria hears a commotion at the seafront. Among the bodies washed up on the shore, she discovers Raymond. After the floating bodies of the survivors of St. Elmo drifted towards Birgu, Ottoman prisoners were executed by the knights and thrown into the sea as a repercussion of what they had just seen. After the fall of St. Elmo, the Ottomans begin the final phase of the siege, the destruction of the remaining Christian strongholds. Where once there was camaraderie, there is only emptiness and regret. Conquering St. Elmo proved a Pyrrhic victory for the Sultan. The Ottomans lost 8,000 men. The attritional fighting changed the course of the entire siege. When a Christian relief force landed in Malia on the 7th of September, 1565, the demoralized Ottomans hastily retreated, expecting a much larger force to follow. De Valette's attempts to get outside assistance before the siege basically were a failure. But paradoxically, that meant that their victory was absolutely their victory. So they really came out as the heroes of Christendom. If the Ottoman Empire won the siege of Malta, the soft underbelly of Europe, Italy, 
would have been exposed to invasion, Sicily would have fallen, Rome would have fallen, and the Islamic Roman Empire that Suleiman the Magnificent always dreamed of would have become a reality. After the siege, Europe's feuding kingdoms realized that they had to stand together to resist the expanding Muslim empire. In 1571, the Christian fleets united and defeated the Ottomans at Lepanto. The European kingdoms also financed the large-scale fortification of Malta creating the modern-day capital, Valletta, named after the Grand Master. The influence of the Knights, even today, is felt. You walk through the streets, practically, and the beautiful buildings you see are all part of the patrimony that was left by the Knights. We relate to the order of the Knights of St. John as being part of us. Unlike other colonizers, this was their home. And that's what made a difference, because they invested in their home. It's fascinating that within 10 years, a boy child uh, have this uh, full transformation from being a Greek child uh, praying in his church, and then he turns into this warrior killing for God, for the Satan. And it's not uh, because he has to do it. They do actually believe in all these uh, chivalric and religious notions. The Siege of Malta epitomizes an important moment of Mediterranean history. People driven by religion, hatred, and fanatism. Hassan, at the age of 35, returns home to his Greek village. He is now a Bektashi Dervish chaplain, attending the recruitment of the next generation. They too will become God's loyal soldiers. <laughs>